Okay, everyone, we can go ahead and get started. So I just want to say hello and you know, thank you all so much for turning into our tuning into our roadmap to results research webinar. So first of all, as we begin all of our conversations conversations lately, I sincerely hope that all of you are safe and healthy. Uh, while we were certainly disappointed not to be able to see you all in person this May, we did release this research on the original timeline. So this virtual conversation is going to be an opportunity for you to dig into that research, ask questions, and provide some feedback for us here at STEM Connector. You have been informed also of a recent leadership transition here at STEM Connector. So we're going to be hearing from the new CEO of STEM Connector, Danielle Pemberton Hurd, momentarily, and some of the goals and visions that she has for this incredible network. But before we get to into any of that engaging content, we're going to um, go ahead and yeah, dive into just some of the logistics. So first of all, um, you can see I just want to make sure everyone's oriented for the conversation and knows how we are going to be handling all of the logistics. Um, and I'm going to go ahead. I'm having obviously technical difficulties and we'll go ahead and fix the screen. Okay, perfect. Um, so we're going to be going into just some of these details and logistics for how we will monitor the conversation. So before we get into that content, just I want you to know that everyone is muted and you, um, so we want to make sure that there's no noise and feedback throughout the room. So everyone's muted and none of you are on video. So it's okay, you know, if you're home in your t-shirts or a hoodie, um, that it's okay. And we are also going to be, we have recorded this presentation and we will be sharing it with all of you later, as well as the slides. So no need to worry if you need to step out or if there's something that you missed or if you want to share it later, we will be sharing that for all of you. Then also we're going to be utilizing the Q&A feature a variety of ways during this conversation for both the technical and logistics questions and feedback and research questions. So um, to use that, you're just going to see at the bottom of your screen, there's a little um, bar where there's a raise hand and a Q&A feature. So to use that Q&A feature, all you have to do is type your question into this little box. You can choose to send it anonymously if you like. If it's a technical question, something that we can respond to directly, we will go ahead and do that in real time. If it's about the research, you can still use that feature and Aaron will be looking at those questions throughout the conversation and saving them to answer during the time that we open it up for questions and feedback. So then the other opportunity that you will have um, to participate in that conversation once Aaron is done with the research element of the presentation is to use the raise hand feature. This is in case you want to actually use your audio and share some information or be just heard instead of typing in your question, you can use the raise hand feature and we will go ahead and unmute you so that you can ask your, your question in real time. So that actually really sums it up for just some of the boring technical stuff and will get us into the content for the day. So I'm really excited to hand the presentation over now to our new CEO who joins STEM Connector from a long legal career, most recently at Diversified Search. She's also been an advisor to STEM Connector for the past year, and I know she has some fantastic things to share with all of you. So I'm going to hand it over now to Danielle pemberton Hurd. Great. Thank you, Ashley. I'm really thrilled to be here with everyone. It's um, a um, enormously um, exciting time here at STEM Connector. Um, first and foremost, as Ashley noted, we are um, very appreciative that sort of in this um, troubled time, people are taking the time to join us today. So we very much appreciate your attendance and your commitment to um, working with us and partnering with us to do some really critical the important work. Um, I come to um, STEM Connector as um, Ashley noted from Diversified Search after um, years of practicing law, but um, also spending significant amount of time um, really focused on um, news, public affairs, and um, my passion for um, children in higher ed and in the educational sector. I'm working very closely with the Department of Education, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and others to really put together content for um, children that needed um, additional supports. So I come to STEM Connector really excited to partner with all of you um, to maintain the legacy created by its founder and the amazing work that Leslie and the team have done in the most recent years to really amplify your brands, to create connections to um, continue to uh, be on the forefront of not only research, but also best practices in this space. Um, ultimately, our goal is to 
is to serve our clients, to be your partner, to create connections, and to also um, really create a, a robust talent pipeline. And I sincerely um, look forward to working with each and every one of you. We have mapped out a pretty aggressive um, timeline and timetable for me to um, get out into the field, um, even virtually, to meet with our core clients, to continue to expand our client base, and more importantly, to um, lift up the um, ecosystem of STEM and develop a pipeline that really um, we can all be proud of. So thank you again, and I pass everything over to Erin White, who has some great information for you all. Thanks so much, Danielle. And I just echo Ashley's excitement over uh, what you're, the, the energy you're bringing to the organization as well as your experience. So we're really thrilled. So I'll just go ahead and, and jump in. You know, usually uh, we're in DC together. The last couple of years, we've been at the Institute of Peace, which those of you who have joined us know is a beautiful space. And I always make a joke that if the research is boring, you can look out the window at the view behind me. Uh, while today that may not be the case, I can tell you that regardless of where we are, I think the research will continue to deepen impact. It doesn't necessarily matter where we present it. It's more about that we try and create research and resources that will help you um, really just, you know, create more good in the world to think about how you can make progress on both your business and your social impact goals. And so I'm really thrilled to be able to share it with you today. As Ashley mentioned, if you have questions or reactions, please feel free to type a question in real time. I'll pause at the end and gather them together. So please feel free to note them along the way using the Q&A feature on your uh, black toolbar. So as I was thinking about this research piece, this roadmap to results, the results we seek are, you know, really a diverse and sustainable STEM workforce today and in the future. And we've talked a lot about what success looks like. It looks like more folks on more pathways into STEM. And so I was reflecting a bit on my own contribution to STEM and on what that looks like. And my own contribution at the moment, this is my 12th grader, Bree. She's, a, she's gonna be a graduate, high school class of 2020 here, virtually in a few weeks. And she's gonna start an engineering degree program this fall, and I'm really proud of her for that. And I was reflecting naturally as a researcher on what are some of the success factors at play. So first I thought about the schools. I thought about the extracurriculars she has the chance to participate in, the project-based learning high school program she's in, teachers who have STEM professional experience, the fact that she can take all kinds of classes, dual enrolled and others. She has 3D printers in her classroom, really cool stuff. And then I thought, well, it's not just about the school, right? It's about the state, the state mandates for project-based learning, state-supported science fairs. It's also about that post-secondary space, the fact she could intern with a local professor, receive scholarships for college for children of military veterans. Certainly, she's lucky to be part of a peer group who's also focused on STEM. And finally, I was reflecting that she does have, have a parent who's a physicist. My husband's a physicist, as I've shared before. And so all of these things together, perhaps, have created success. And then I try to say, what's the one thing that led her to enroll in this program? What's the one question? Unsurprisingly, for those of you who have engaged with STEM Connector before, you know we fundamentally believe it's not just one thing. There's not just one factor for success. It's a confluence of factors. It's numbers of solutions. And what worked for Brie, the one or two things or 25 things that worked for Brie may not have worked for someone else in her class. The thing that worked for her given her context and her family and community may not work in another community. And so that's what's hard and what was hard when I set out to write this piece because there's not just the one solution. And as much as I wish I could advise you on the one solution, we actually need to be mindful of the complexity of the problem that faces us and thus the solutions. So instead of giving you an endless list of solutions in this paper, I set out to help you think about how to choose the right solution for you. As always um, with these pieces, you know, we think about doing a few different jobs with each research piece, both unpacking the STEM talent complexity, solving for it, and then how to execute for greater success. Um, and as I've mentioned before, this piece in particular is more tailored to a corporate employer audience or an employer audience. That said, the implications therein really do, um, you know, point us in the direction of new partnerships with nonprofits, education institutions, and others across the STEM talent ecosystem. 
So let's jump in before we solve the problem. Just a quick, a quick recap of the foundations. And you know, some of you say, "Gosh, Aaron, why do you come back to this state of STEM or to the definition again and again?" I'm a big believer that to solve the problem, you have to continue to understand the foundation of what you're trying to accomplish. And so this definition is something that you all helped create, that the 100 plus interviews that I did, all of the literature we reviewed, pointed us in the direction of a definition of STEM that's beyond just the four different words that make up the acronym. So we're not gonna add to the acronym, uh, but rather we're gonna expand our understanding of what it means. To understand the complexity of STEM, of course, you have to think about who's involved. And as Danielle mentioned, we believe it's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem of individuals, of organizations, and of sectors that are connected, whether they know it or not. It's also about the forces that are putting pressure on the systems and are, are being pressured by what's inside those systems. So there's a lot of people involved in it, and this slide shows the image pretty neatly. Um, but as many of you know, we have a, a more detailed ecosystem map that allows you to dig more into the complexity and connections within it. Continuing to unpack this complexity for just a moment more before we dive into solutions. You know, we've all realized that it's not just one gap that actually there are multiple gaps. Now I've bucketed them in five different gap buckets, but you may have others that you find. And it's really just representing this idea that the STEM talent challenge isn't that we only need five more engineers. It's not that we just need kids to take more calculus or that we need a few more people to graduate with a degree. Rather, it's this confluence of different types of challenges that look different for every community and every business. And if you'd like to dig more, I encourage you to, to, to visit or, or revisit the state of STEM piece. Finally, we get to success. What does success look like? You know, I started there uh, with what success looked like for me. It was having, you know, a talented young high school student on the brink of starting her own STEM journey. Um, but su success for all of us is, you know, something a bit, a bit bigger than that. It's a diverse and STEM ready talent pool who are ready to go in careers today, but also in the future and not just a job, but a career. And we recognize that success isn't just about the success of an individual, an individual's mindset or aptitude or knowledge or know-how or can-do attitude. It's also about the systems, the systems around those individuals that are aligned, equipped, and focused to help those individuals succeed. So it's thinking about those two pieces together where we get to success. All right, so what's the so what? What does that mean for how we approach solving these problems? Well, what it means is that we need to think about the substance of the solutions, the people involved, and the timeframes involved in enacting those solutions. Uh, the substance of the solutions, like where I started, it's more than one. More than one solution is needed by more than one organization. Uh, solutions are required at both levels of the individual and the system. And you know, when it comes to the people involved, it's not just more than one organization or sector, but it's also thinking about how they interact with each other. And the fact that learning and success are shared across the ecosystem, not isolated. If it's not just one magic solution, there can't just be one magic solver, so to speak. When it comes to the time frame of these solutions, we have to think systemically, which means we have to think about multiple time horizons simultaneously, now and in the future, and that this is an iterative process. You know, when you think about, you know, classic design methodology or prototyping, it's about trying, learning, and trying again, and that's how we'll succeed in this complex STEM talent crisis. So that just is a, a refresher or maybe a regrounding in the complexity of the challenge that we face and the people and the sectors that are involved. So now we can turn to solutions. And as we turn to solutions, as we think about how an employer can solve for STEM talent complexity, you know, again, I ask you to keep in mind, feel free to use the Q&A feature at any time. I'll come back to it in just a bit. Uh, and just keep in mind the, the complexity that we just covered. What's the first step? How do, you, how do you get to success? Well, the first thing you have to do is define the R and ROI. 
you know, and the way that we think about ROI at STEM Connector, as we've articulated, is that you have to think across multiple time horizons and also multiple types of return at the same time. So that long-term growth in the talent pool will require a different focus and a different set of solutions than dealing with your short-term talent needs. And anything you do can have brand benefit. Uh, something that we've learned is that, you know, defining return in an employer isn't just the job of one person, but rather multiple business areas and functions, because usually return happens, uh, or different types of functions of business lines have different types of return in mind. And if you're engaging everyone, you're more likely to capture both your business and social impact needs and goals, and also those short and long term time horizons. Again, if you're eager to revisit some of these foundations around ROI, I point you back to the input to impact piece as well. So, you know, when we start with that, that process of selecting a solution, we got to start with what's our goal, what's our return that we seek, and then that helps us start to imagine where do we need to target within these pipelines and pathways. The second step after you get your goal is to assess and think about what type of capital is available to you to deploy. Now we've bucketed, again, as you know, I like buckets. We've bucketed five different types of capital. Um, and the, you know, the divisions are somewhat artificial, but I think this just gives us a way to think about all of the tools available in our employer toolboxes. And that it's not just about using one, but perhaps bundling multiple types of capital to get to success. Now, while they're intuitive, you know, programmatic capital, we know what programs are, or dollars and financial sense, human capital, you know, the, the manpower, the employees who are ready to volunteer, intellectual capital, what we know about industry, social or political, the, the, the will and the advocacy and the relationships that we have, you know, those are pretty intuitive. And what I'd suggest is it's more thinking about how and where to deploy them strategically so that you can meet those return goals that you already set. So programmatic work, you know, I'd offer should be more connected to short term talent returns. And what I mean by that is if you're going to build a big internship program, you're going to put a lot of maybe some money into it, you're going to put some people behind it, a whole department behind it. Lots of folks are involved. Maybe you have some executive champions. You know, I'm thinking, for example, like a great, you know, program that Abbott has with an intern high school internship. If you're creating a program you're gonna to wanna to see the results in the shorter term. If you're running it as an employer, you're, you wanna see um, that feedback. And so you wanna connect, if you're putting that energy, that programmatic capital out there, connect more to short-term returns. You know, programs are also great in areas where you yourself can shape practices and control variables. If you want to program around developing employees, a lot of that is on you. You may choose a partner to help you do it well, but it's about how you create pathways for learning, development, promotion, uh, sponsorship, and growth within your organization. So creating big programs is really something you want to think about related to short-term return and also in areas that, that you can control in some ways. That's how you get the most bang for your programmatic capital buck. Uh, as, we, as we turn to financial capital, you know, this is, we know how to write checks. Um, and, you know, so many folks out there are so thoughtful about philanthropy and are, are just pivoting right now in this time of deep need in the COVID crisis. In general, we want to think about financial capital as being flexible. You can deploy it in areas that are maybe outside of your core expertise as a business, but that you know matter. You know, so many people right now are giving to fight food insecurity. You as a business, if you're a technology business, you might not be an expert in food insecurity, but if you know it matters, you're able to deploy your financial capital there. And those are also maybe areas where a direct infusion of cash contributes the most. You know, we had some great questions on our last research webinar just about, you know, supporting, you know, uh, the administrative needs of nonprofits, nonprofit overhead. That's an area where direct infusion of dollars is actually really critical. So again, you know, each of these types of capital are important, but you can get more out of them if you're thoughtful about how and where you deploy them. Moving to human capital, as we think about things like employee volunteering programs, you know, I realize this is pretty, pretty intuitive, but if you, if you can tap into employee passion and affinity, you're going to get greater success. You want to, you know, maybe folks are interested in, in dealing with young children or uh, mentoring young professionals. Maybe they're interested in the post-secondary space or they're interested in advising someone on policy. It really is tapping into that natural passion and affinity. You also want to be thoughtful about doubling down on your human capital in areas where key geographies, where you need to see a brand benefit, where you want to be seen as a great community partner and as an employer of choice. So, you know, deploy more of your human capital in those key geographies. 
When we think about intellectual capital, what I mean here is, is really just, you know, your understanding of business, your understanding of maybe what your industry vertical needs, your understanding of, of the types of skills that are at the cutting edge of technology. And, and that's valuable knowledge that maybe your education system uh, doesn't have or can't keep their finger on the pulse of as quickly. And this is where I think you want to focus on, you know, areas of natural partnership with educators, areas where, you know, communities where you have some, some maybe some great university recruiting partnerships and you can add some value there by then becoming a trusted advisor around industry needs and changes. So your intellectual capital, you know, certainly you're using some time, but it's, it's incredibly valuable and maybe, maybe overlooked sometimes. Now, the final type of capital, that's social or political, you know, this is really about making those differences. It's about leveraging your existing relationships uh, with, with business, with community leaders, with government, and doing things that help enhance the overall STEM talent ecosystem. So in this case, it may be, you know, you may choose to advocate for a certain policy set around STEM education, because that, that actually helps the entirety of the ecosystem, not just one part of it. And, you know, you can combine these, these types of capital, um, you know, to really maximize impact and just doing one doesn't mean you're, you're not doing another. It's more just being thoughtful about how and where you deploy the capital to reach the return you've already defined. So we define the return or the goal. We understand our capital and how and where to deploy it. And then finally, uh, we can choose solutions. Now, this is uh, when I started working on these slides, I thought this is the slide where I need to give the caveat. I, I don't have an endless list of solutions for you. Uh, there are many out there. I've named some of them. And one of the pieces of feedback we got on the pre-release webinar that I thought was so powerful. You know, it's okay to say, I'm not certain what the best solution is for my community. So I'm going to engage with my partners, maybe even with my competitors to understand what's needed and where I fit. So engaging with other leaders and other sectors, you might get to a better solution. But again, more buckets for you today. You can think about different types of solutions out there. There are some solutions that are really in your control. And this is you know, what, one of many classic images that I'm sure you have of an employee life cycle. There's a lot of solutions around hiring, around job descriptions, around development, around how to manage performance, recognize staff. Those are known. There are entire bodies of literature on them, many conferences, and you have a lot of equipped and experienced professionals in your organizations. So I encourage you to focus on some of those, really double down on some of those solutions that you can do, maybe with a trusted partner, but certainly where you have some control over what is in that job description? Am I asking for a degree when one isn't needed? You know, those are areas where you can, um, you know, potentially move pretty quickly. The second type of solutions we identify here has to do with areas of intersection between sectors. So if you're an employer, there's some natural opportunities for you to partner with post-secondary, to create internships, to do projects, to create co-op programs, to support, you know, industry certifications or advise on curriculum. The employer system also interacts with K-12. Again, doing those internships, apprenticeships, advising on CTE, providing job shadowing, you know, that's another really powerful category of solution uh, that can, can really be helpful in enhancing your partnerships in key communities. And the final bucket of solutions are things that, you know, for an employer, they don't really involve you, uh, but they're really important in building the future STEM workforce. So I have a screenshot here of a great piece by our partner at STEM Next Opportunity Fund, just about the, the power of family engagement in STEM. You know, if you're an employer uh, in a technology company or an oil and gas or consumer goods company, you're not necessarily thinking about how can I equip the parents in my community with the knowledge, skills, and, and confidence to be their child's advocates in STEM. And that's okay if that's not your core expertise. That may be an area where, again, you deploy some philanthropic capital to those who do have that expertise. So that's another set of solutions, solutions that we know have to happen for success, but maybe aren't in sort of the core spot of an employer. So we can kind of name all the solutions out there and then really think about how to do them effectively. So again, just a quick reminder, if you have questions as I'm going through this last section, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box and I'll get to them in just a few minutes. Um, you know, it's not just what you do. Let's say you have a, a beautiful goal. You have a, a really well thought out plan to deploy different types of capital. And you've identified a couple of different solutions. We will get to greater success, I would suggest, if we can execute 
with a bigger picture in mind, if we can execute solutions with attention to detail, with attention to best practice, with attention to equity, that's how we're gonna really move forward. So not just choosing the best solution, but doing it well. I'll give you a couple of frameworks, about three frameworks or, or ideas on how you might do it well. Um, one is dosage. Now, this is a bit of a, a reconception of an idea that I've, I've been working on with you for a little while now. And, you know, measuring the dosage of a solution, it really, it's much more, as I say, estimation than precision. You, you can't necessarily measure three milligrams of STEM experience. That's not, that's not a thing, right? What you can measure is how long did this person experience the solution? How often are they experiencing it? And sort of taken together, that creates the dosage, the how much. And you know, there is evidence behind these, these components. It's not just sort of a, a cute image. You know, in general, longer duration will yield greater impact. So there was a, a large study of um, youth after school programming. And what they found is that the largest increases in STEM career interests, knowledge, critical thinking, STEM engagement, that the largest increases came after four weeks or more of STEM activities. So that was that duration and that study said four weeks was was a magic number. Now don't quote me on it. It's not always four weeks. Sometimes it might be four years. Um, but you know, thinking about over time, it wasn't just one after school program. You know, from a frequency perspective, you know, it makes sense that more repeated instances of exposure and experience matter, even for us adult learners. You know, for example, we've seen that college students, it's been shown, need exposure to math concept, concepts nearly daily over a given duration to get to mastery. Uh, so it can't just be, you know, one long class period, but multiple exposures. So those are, again, some of these are pretty intuitive, but when we're designing programs, funding programs, deploying capital, we have to think about both the structure of dosage and then you know if those individuals in the community are maybe experiencing um, other dosage from other members that we can take into account so this is the the dosage component of execution the second execution uh, component here is depth or breadth so you know programs in general not just programs but all of our work it, you know, involves some trade-offs. And in general, but not always, if you want to get a depth of outcome, something that's really transformative, you need to think about uh, a, a greater investment of time, resource, manpower, et cetera. So a 12-month paid internship program, for example, might yield greater talent returns in the short term and also greater long-term returns for the students as far as their STEM interest. Uh, but there's some lift, so maybe you can't reach as many people. This is just a high school example, but you can think about this for your own employee population, for, uh, you know, for post-secondary students, et cetera. You know, an online marketing campaign might allow you to reach a lot more folks with a message, uh, but maybe it's not gonna be the transformative piece. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, it's not just the one solution, it's multiple solutions. So in your own portfolio, you can think about some that are more about breadth and some that are about depth. Why this matters is it links back to what return you wanna see. If the return you wanna see is um, you know, short-term talent, you know, improvement, you want to see that hiring, you wanna see a better yield rate in your internship program, you know, that's gonna be that deeper outcome. You're not gonna reach as many kids, but maybe you're gonna get there. So thinking about breadth and depth has implications for uh, how you measure your success and then how you communicate your success out to the community. The final component of success is something that I think often is meant as an afterthought instead of being embedded. And I think of equity not as one solution. There's not an equity solution, but rather it's a mindset, it's an approach, it's a set of actions that can be taken within any solution that you do. It's about assessing barriers to awareness, participation, and success. And you know, the challenges faced by women in STEM, for example, are different than the challenges faced by American Indian Alaskan Natives in STEM. And it's recognizing those and then being able to tailor solutions accordingly. So if you'll indulge me for a minute and a little bit of data, this is how I, I think about embedding equity. This is a, a quick snapshot of a graph from one of our presentation builder slides here at STEM Connector. And it just shows eighth grade students who are proficient in uh, math they score proficient, the average is the hash line. And within each of these categories, you see that students who are eligible for free or reduced lunch score lower than students who aren't. Students who are English language learners score lower than not. Students with disabilities score lower than not. 
So if you're doing some sort of program in education in the K-12 years, an equity solution takes into account for the fact that these groups may need very different things to maintain the outcome, to obtain the outcome that we hope they want to achieve. So an equity solution has to be grounded in data or, or maybe another data piece here. You know, we've, we've heard a lot lately about students remote learning or uh, those of us em uh, employed remote working. And but what we know is that rural communities have less access to broadband than, um, than urban or suburban communities. This, this is no, this is a real challenge. Um, as, whether it's in COVID or not, uh, this is a real challenge. So an equity solution that takes into account connectivity matters. Or maybe let's, let's jump ahead. Let's think about the post-secondary years and the fact that students of color are more likely to switch out of STEM majors than white students and understanding what those barriers are, what's happening there, how can we address it? And finally, we can look at things like the percentage of adults in STEM who report, I've experienced gender discrimination at work and we see you know, more women. So what all this data says is that we do have challenges that are related to diversity, equity, inclusion in STEM in any solution, any internship program, any mentorship, any after school program, any scholarship, whatever you're doing, needs to account for the specific and diverse needs of the populations you're hoping to serve. And any solution, any solution can become an equity solution, but you have to be intentional about it. You have to say, I want more students to be in my internship, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and pay. Or I'd like more students to stick it out in this program, and I think I need to, to embed a mentoring component. And, and this is where execution will really, uh, will really matter. If we want to achieve that goal, that collective goal we set out of a diverse and sustainable STEM workforce. So now it's time for me to turn to you. Um, I've shared some thoughts. I've shared a little bit about how you can approach solutions, choosing solutions, and how we can approach executing solutions for greater success. Um, so if you'd like, I'll give you a second. If you want to um, put some questions in the, in the box, I see I have a few already I'm excited to dive into. Um, but I can also, uh, after I answer a couple of these questions online, I'm going to go ahead and we'll go to, to the phone, so to speak. So there's a question, a couple of questions that came in around, can you give me an example of, dif of combining different types of capital? Um, and you know, one that comes to mind, I'll just use an example. I don't know if anyone from TCS is on the line, um, but I think about the TCS Go IT program. And that's a program that combines human capital in the form of employee volunteers alongside philanthropic investment in programming and students in schools alongside some social capital and creating you know, partnerships with local government. So that, that one program, that TCS Go IT program, I encourage you to check it out. We've been doing some profiles of it. You know, that one program combines those different forms of capital. So that's just, just one example of how you, know, you can be thoughtful about it. And, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, the divisions between the types of capital are somewhat artificial, but it can be helpful in thinking about everything available to you. Um, another question asked about how, how can we approach different types of employers? So a corporate employer has sort of one set of needs, but what about a, a government employer? What about a, a, a local or federal agency employer? And I think, you know, where the thing that changes is that some of your return has to do with your public mission. Um, every, you know, you still have a return around short and long-term talent pipeline building, uh, and you still have maybe, maybe a brand benefit but you also likely have another line. If I were gonna draw that graph, I, I might put it in sort of at an angle or something cute like that, but you have another um, mission return that you need to, uh, to serve. And I think, you know, our, our member NASA, um, I've, heard, I've heard several folks from NASA say, you know, our mission, it, critical need is people because people help us achieve our mission. So I think being able to define that goal and that mission goal is another, um, maybe, maybe in just another sort of vector, if you will. But a lot of the other components, I think, remain, remain the same. Um, another question that came in was, um, and I appreciate this one, Erin, I know you don't want to give us a list of solutions, but are you sure you can't suggest a few? Um, and, you know, I've mentioned some, and I think we, 
we all uh, have have our favorites. Um, you know, and I'd, I'd point you to a lot of, again, I'd point you to the experts in your community first. I'd point you to, if you, if you want to read the, the 100 page reports from the National Academies, they've highlighted the best practices in K-12 and post-secondary education. But in general, I go back to a few key words, exposure, experience, and relationships. Um, people need to be exposed both to STEM content and to STEM careers throughout their, their life cycle, throughout their career, even into adulthood. They need to experience it in different ways, hands-on learning opportunities in K-12 and in post-secondary and again in the workforce and relationships, you know, the power of relationships to spark and excite, um, to, to think about how to, how to guide, how to navigate relationships that might be mentoring, relationships that might be formal, relationships that look like sponsorship as we're trying to move individuals up and into higher levels of leadership and organizations, you know, relationships come into play. So those are, those are three that, that are grounded in research that I, that I like, that I would, I would point out. And then maybe if I could have a fourth, I would say resources. You know, we do have to be real about what's needed for people to access education, um, to access opportunities, to, you know, to have transportation to a job. So being mindful of the resources that people need, whether that's, you know, financial or otherwise, I'd say that would be another, another solution. But again, not just one. It's, it's the full suite. So at this point, um, I do have, I think, a few more questions in the Q&A, but I just wanted to give folks a chance. If you do want to comment live, um, please use the raise your hand feature and I will call on you. Feels a bit strange to say. Um, otherwise, I will just go back to, to the written questions that have been coming in. All right, so one, uh, one final written, written question here um, is, you know, thinking, thinking about equity again and just giving another example of how you embed equity in a solution. So I gave the example of paying, paying interns um, makes an internship more about equity and creating that uh, opportunity, removing a barrier to entry. I think um, you know, being mindful about when you're uh, publicizing any kind of program or opportunity that people receive information through very different channels. And so you might have a program and you say, we, we posted it to our website, but if no one knows how to get to your website or even thinks about your organization or your program, you know, that, that's a barrier. And so you can think about those trusted partners who can help you reach into communities that matter to you to get the word out. Um, so that immediately helps you think about equity. And in general, I just put on that, that mindset of what are the barriers to access and to success, um, not just to getting in, but to staying on track and then to being successful. And when you ask, ask those questions, you start to kind of unpack um, some of the opportunities for any given, any given solution to be an equity solution. So if you do have more questions or comments, of course, please feel free to reach out and email me. Again, I know, unfortunately, we don't have the chance to chat over the lunch break at a summit right now. I am confident we'll be able to do that again soon. Um, your client services leads are also on hand to help you think about how this research applies to your STEM talent strategies, to your solution sets. Um, it's not just for folks who are trying to do a new solution, but even just think about how can I you know, refresh my portfolio and get to greater impact. So I just wanna thank you all for, for tuning in and kind of listening to my research run today. I'm, I'm really excited about this piece. I think it brings together a few threads and, and obviously I'm excited uh, you know, to, to really continue to learn alongside you. I'll turn it back over to Ashley now to share a little bit more about some of the great ways you can get engaged with us. Ashley? Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you for that great presentation, and as always, for continuing to produce research, especially at a time when none of us really know what's coming next. Um, so just to close us out, I want to just give a couple of opportunities for continued engagement as we are working to continue to provide research and resources and data and virtual engagement opportunities during this time of social distance. 
So first of all, I'm, I'm sure that you've seen our recent communications sharing newly released research, including the latest update to our Overlooked Talent Pools and STEM data series. So this series is really just to help you organize and prioritize your own investments in Overlooked Talent Pools by providing research and data specific to these target groups. So the latest release really dove into the priority issues facing rural residents and communities when it comes to following STEM pathways. You can download both this one pager that you see on your screen, but also the larger deep dive through our presentation builder, which is available on the website. Last week, we also released the latest in our state of STEM data series, where we're answering frequently asked questions that we're getting about the STEM talent ecosystem. And this latest actually shared some positive news, which I know all of us were, are excited to get these days. And we dove into some of the progress that has been made in developing STEM talent in recent years. So you can watch the video and also download the one pager that's along with that on our website as well. So coming soon in that series, just building on what Aaron was talking about, we're going to be continuing to produce additional deep dives into specific solutions to help inform your own strategy and execution. So we released, recently released the Regional Approaches to STEM Workforce Development paper just to help companies understand cradle to career efforts and the best points of intersection at which they should invest. And then coming later this summer and fall, you can see additional solution deep dives in mentoring STEM as well as reskilling and upskilling and more deep dives into the, some of those overlooked talent pools that we were just talking about. So then, of course, as always, we're going to just remind everyone of some of the fantastic resources that we continue to have available to support you in thinking about your STEM talent strategy and investments. All of this is available through your member portal, including the frameworks and tools like the Roadmap to Results paper in the Interactive STEM Talent Ecosystem Map, the solution deep dives into specific solutions, and of course, our data and asset, assets and analyses. So of course, if you have any questions, just a quick reminder, I'm not going to spend too much time walking through this because I know that just about everyone on this virtual event has already taken advantage of this, but all of these great resources are members only, so therefore you do need to be logged in as a member to access them. If you're unsure about how to create or access your account, always feel free to reach out to your client representative who can support you in that. We're also, as I said, going to be sharing this slide deck. So these details will be on there for you as well. So you'll be able to do that. So then I want to share an update because I know, you know, we had sent with you originally an additional save the date and hopes for our annual summit that we can have an in-person event in this fall. And my update for you is that we have no update. <laughs> So we're not quite ready to make an announcement about this event just yet. So I do want you to stay tuned for updates as we're working to explore what's possible, both in terms of bringing people together over our shared mission and approach, but also while, of course, maintaining health and safety across our network. So there are opportunities that we're exploring and thinking about. And the bottom line here is we're just not ready to make a call on it yet, but we are certainly keeping it top of mind and we'll keep you informed. But in the interim, just please also stay tuned for additional upcoming virtual opportunities we're gonna to continue to share with you. Um, and let us know for additional opportunities that you either want us to engage in or ideas that you have for us to share our work. We're working right now on some additional webinars, some potential roundtables, more Twitter chats to dive into the research, but we are really always looking for additional ideas and opportunities, even across the distance. Our network is obviously central to everything that we do. And so we're doing everything possible just to stay connected and collaborative during this time of separation. And I know you all have some great ideas as well. And so on that note, you know, I know most of you have heard now from your client services representative about a survey that we're doing just to help us keep our finger on the pulse of everything all of our members are doing during COVID-19. So whether you're someone who is on the front lines or you're creating resources or you reallocated resources or you're just really doing a lot to invest in your communities, anything like that, we just want to hear about it, support it, and amplify it where appropriate. So this we know is an incredible network of dedicated leaders who we know have pivoted and shifted priorities while really making a difference in the community across the world. And we really just want to work with you and contribute to those efforts as much as we possibly can. So please do let us know if you have questions about that effort or if you have anything to share, ideas for how we can amplify that work. We are absolutely looking to contribute to it. And so on that note, just thank you so much once again for tuning into this conversation and for providing the robust and engaging feedback that you all have. As I mentioned previously, we are going to be sharing both the recording and the slides so that you can continue to dive into this content and share it with your own networks. But if you have additional questions about the research, I have put Erin's email here above, um, and she's always happy to get back to you. I've also included my own email in case you have general communications questions or questions about upcoming events. I'll, obviously, as always, you can also reach out to your client services representative, Ted or Amy, for anything else that you might need. And so just thank you once again, all of you, for spending some time with us today and for engaging in our research. And as always, please stay safe and healthy.